Donna Arnett, and I'm here in New Orleans with the launch of the ACC AHA Prevention Guidelines. I'm the Dean of Public Health at the University of Kentucky and past president of the American Heart Association. Hi, I'm Erin Mikos, and I'm the Associate Director of Preventive Cardiology at Johns Hopkins University, and I also was a co-author on the 2019 ACC AHA Primary Prevention Guidelines. So these are some exciting new guidelines. It's a one-stop shop for all prevention. So we've pulled everything everyone needs to know about prevention of cardiovascular disease into one guideline. So Erin, what is your favorite part that you think is most different about this guideline? Well, I do like the fact that it's a one-stop shop, and I really like the three overarching messages that I think you'll uh, talk about more. Um, we emphasize lifestyle, we emphasize shared decision-making, we emphasize social determinants of health, and that's the overarching theme before we get into the individual risk factors. That's right. You know, the patient is really at the center of these new guidelines, really listening to the patient and their preferences in terms of assessing their risk and how they want to move forward. Um, and we also really focus on that team-based approach. You mm -hmm. know, we realize that clinicians are very busy, but what we know from the evidence after doing these guidelines is patients listen to their physicians, and if they are advised to lose weight or they're advised to stop smoking, it works. And so using a team-based approach where we bring in those other practitioners that can augment the physician um, to address those risk factors, I think is another really interesting part of the guidelines. Right, so this really brings things together from previous documents that, such as the blood pressure guidelines and the cholesterol guidelines that the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology have already done. And it uh, updates the review with um, new things that have come out in the past year. So we have updated recommendations on aspirin, um, but it really just puts it all together, all these different pieces, so that you can have one comprehensive resource for both clinicians and public health communities to address the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. And just one more focus that I think is unique, and you've mentioned already, is for every um, recommendation we make, we say to clinicians, look at your patient's social, social factors and assess whether or not they have access to foods that are healthy. Do they have access to places to exercise? So for each of these domains, we recognize that you have to meet patients where they are and make recommendations specific to where they are at that time and what they can afford. So why don't we take a deep dive into the specifics? So I'll review uh, the new recommendations on diet. So there is uh, one new change, which is our first harm recommendation in the diet section, and that is to eliminate trans fat from your diet. Um, we recommend a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and fish as the basic diet um, of, of all people um, for preventing cardiovascular disease. Minimize processed foods, minimize processed meats and red meats, um, and replace saturated fats with mono and polyunsaturated fats. So those are um, the new headlines of the diet guidelines. So um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was risk assessment. Um, so first of all, lifestyle remains the foundation of prevention. It's the most important way to prevent cardiovascular disease. But we've continued the theme from previous guidelines that in order to um, maximize preventive therapies, particularly drug therapies, you want to match it to the absolute risk of the patient. So uh, we still continue with a class one recommendation that adults age 40 to 75 should have their 10-year risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease uh, estimated by the pooled cohort equations. And this way we can um, um, int uh, maximize anticipated benefits, but also minimize harm from overtreatment. But we understand that that's just a starting point. And so the guidelines continue the theme that was introduced in the cholesterol guidelines of looking at a number of clinical factors. We call them risk enhancing factors, um, such as having a family history or metabolic syndrome or having elevated LDL cholesterol, a number of biomarkers, preeclampsia. There's a whole bunch of different factors. And if these factors are present, this would favor the decision to initiate a statin or perhaps intensify therapy um, for those already taking a statin. But even after we consider those clinical factors, in part of this shared decision conversation that we have with the patient, 
we realize that there still might be patient indecision or clinical uncertainty about one's risk. And in those cases, uh, we recommend a coronary artery calcium score by a cardiac CT that can further help reclassify individuals and do higher or lower risk groups so they can make the best decisions about preventative medications, notably statin therapy. So that's really interesting. Um, does that also apply in the blood pressure domain as well? So we use the risk assessment to help uh, suggest uh, healthy targets for blood pressure. So for individuals who have blood pressures above 130 over 80, if they're also above a 10% 10-year risk using that risk calculator, we recommend initiating um, blood pressure uh, pharmacotherapy on top of lifestyle therapy. Again, lifestyle is the overall uh, basis of, of all these preventive therapies. Whereas individuals who are at lower risk, um, we might not consider pharmacotherapy for blood pressure unless their blood pressure is above 140 over 90. But once we initiate therapy, a general target is trying to get uh, below 130 over 80 for most individuals. So these risk scores are becoming the mainstay of preventive cardiology and, and something that primary care physicians, nurses, practitioners, everyone should be really assessing. Right, and so the nice thing is that a lot of um, electronic medical records, EMRs, will calculate these for uh, physicians based on um, data that's already in medical records, blood pressure, cholesterol, so it'll come up with a number. But I think what was really important is that this number is the, this risk estimate. It's just that, it's an estimate. It's the start of a conversation. It is not a mandate to start medications. That's why we make these more personalized. We consider these other clinical factors and we even consider uh, coronary artery calcium scores to help. So the risk assessment is really a key starting point, but it's not the end point. And I think too, Erin, I think that is why we had such a focus on shared decision making because these really are conversations um, to get the patient to the right place with their physician and their treatment. Mm -hmm. So in physical activity, um, we, the guidelines came out last fall at, at AHA from the, um, the CDC. Uh, we recommended 150 minutes a week of moderate activity or 75 minutes a week of vigorous activity for all Americans. Uh, one caveat is that if you're unable to do that amount of physical activity, we recommend you do something. So every little bit counts and we believe that even small amounts of activity can be beneficial to prevent cardiovascular risk. And then finally, we, we suggest people be less sedentary. You know, as Americans, on average, we're spending about 16 hours a day sleeping or in sedentary behavior. Right. One of the newer things with the, these guidelines is that we actually have newer recommendations on aspirin um, for primary prevention. And so again, these documents are for primary prevention for individuals who have no clinical signs of cardiovascular disease. And this doesn't apply to individuals who've already had a heart attack or a coronary stent where aspirin's still recommended. But based on some recent trials in this past year and, and recent meta-analyses, um, aspirin's got um, a bit of a de-emphasis in these new guidelines in that um, for most healthy individuals uh, do not need to take an aspirin for primary prevention. Um, there still might be a role um, and might be considered in very select individuals age 40 to 70 who are particularly high risk uh, for having a heart attack but are at low uh, risk for bleeding and, and that's going to take a conversation to figure out who those individuals are. But for most individuals actually um, there's not a strong endorsement for aspirin. In addition, we actually have some harm statements. So one of those important trials that came out last year was the ESPRI trial, and it evaluated healthy older adults over the age of 70. And not only was aspirin not beneficial in those older uh, individuals, but there actually was harm. There was increased risk for bleeding and actually increased mortality. And so we have a class three recommendation, a harm statement saying that most healthy over older adults over the age of 70 should not take aspirin for primary prevention. We also uh, say that any individuals at any age who are at high risk for bleeding also should not take aspirin for primary prevention. Right, and this is a critical point for mm -hmm. clinicians out there because I think this is what's gonna get patients 
calling their doctor's office first thing Monday morning after these guidelines hit the press, what do I do about aspirin? So key points, it doesn't apply to secondary prevention. So if you've had an event, you should stay on your aspirin if your doctor has prescribed it. If you are, um, have not had an event yet, it's most likely that you do not need to take aspirin. Uh, you should discuss it with your physician to see if you have these enhanced risks uh, for cardiovascular disease that warrant it. But I think this is an area uh, that's gonna generate the most concern among our population. Right, so I think that's one of the key new things that was in this document. We didn't have uh, recommendations uh, uh, recently from the American Heart Association on aspirin. So the other new area that we have not had a recommendation about before is smoking cessation. And so one of the, the interesting pieces in this new guideline is that we ask clinicians to record smoking use at every clinic visit um, as a vital sign. So just like your blood pressure and heart rate, smoking status should be assessed. And we recommend smoking cessation and very strong advice to quit smoking among those who, who smoke. And we list the, the five different kinds of nicotine replacement and the two adjunctive therapies that are proven to be beneficial. So all of those are in our guideline, um, but smoking cessation remains a key piece of primary prevention. Right. And I also, we also touch on diabetes, which is a really strong risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And so diabetes is throughout the whole document. For example, even in the cholesterol recommendations, that we indicate that di patients with diabetes should be on at least a moderate intensity statin without, you don't have to calculate that 10 year risk score that um, patients with diabetes should take a statin. And if they have multiple risk factors, we actually recommend a high intensity statin to try to reduce their LDL by at least 50%. Um, so in addition, um, there's also a focus on uh, medications that can uh, uh, lower blood glucose, but we acknowledge that um, cardiovascular risk reduction among patients with diabetes is more than just blood glucose lowering. Again, it's this comprehensive approach with lifestyle, diet, physical activity, controlling blood pressure, controlling lipids. Um, but after lifestyle is not enough, um, we do recommend metformin as still the first line medication for reducing blood glucose. And then recently, there's been some newer classes of medications, SGL2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists that have benefits on cardiovascular risk reduction that actually seem to go beyond just their blood glucose lowering effects. Now, most of the data for these drugs is in secondary prevention. Um, so we gave it a 2B indication, which means that these drugs may be considered if we need additional glucose lowering therapy. Um, and I think though, as uh, you know, emerging evidence continues to come out about these drugs, we'll see them being used a lot more for prevention. I agree, and, and certainly once we get some primary prevention cohorts mm -hmm. exclusively with those agents, if they show the same benefit, I, I definitely agree with you. So to wrap up, you know, uh, AHA has had this Life Simple 7, uh, addressing these four behaviors and three risk factors for cardiovascular disease, there to uh, stop smoking, to maintain a healthy body weight, to eat a healthy diet, and to exercise, and then manage your blood pressure, manage your cholesterol, manage your blood glucose. And that's what these guidelines are all about. We really take each one and do a deep dive into the evidence and come up with a one-stop shop for our clinicians. So what are your three take-home messages from these guidelines, Erin? So my top three favorite is, again, the emphasis on lifestyle changes as the foundation for all prevention throughout all of the theme. And then I really do care about the strong emphasis is on the first page about the social determinants of health. That we know that uh, social economic inequalities are a key determinant of cardiovascular risk. And so it's really important to ask our patients about whether they uh, have a safe place to exercise, whether they have access to healthy food sources, whether they have transportation, whether they have health insurance or adequate health insurance. Because any recommendations that we make, it can't be implemented effectively unless we address these social determinants. And the fact that that is such a key focus of the guidelines, I think is a, a unique part of this document. I couldn't agree more. We have to meet patients where they are. and. Uh, we have a tsunami of cardiovascular disease coming down in America. We are already there. So we have to do all that we can to stop that. 
So on behalf of the ACC AHA Guideline Committee, thank you and good wishes from New Orleans. Thank you.